First of all, I'd like to say how great it is to be back in Newport. My very early memories of Newport was my father bringing me one of the famous ice creams in Chambers. <laughs> Alas, they are no more. But the person I'm going to talk about today has become one of my great heroes. The person I'm going to talk about today has become one of my great heroes, and that is the Quaker James Hack Chu. And indeed, the, you know, um, if you're interested in the story of James Hack Chu, okay, there are copies of two of the books, there are collections of essays which um, tell the role of James Hack Chu in Irish history, one during the Great Famine, the other one in relation to his assisted emigration scheme. Because emigration has been one of the great exports that Ireland had in the 19th century. <coughs> About 8 million people emigrated between 1815 and 1914 from Ireland. Now, it's the one thing I always emphasise is that these are 8 million stories. Okay, when we look at the a figure, a figure very often, you know, the, you know, um, the a figure, a figure very often, you know, the, you know, um, escapes us in terms of what the in, is behind the individual associated with that story. In the same way that the 55,000 Ukrainian refugees that are in Ireland at the moment, every one of them, not immigration. Is immigration is determined by two main factors, what we describe as pull and push factors. And the Irish experience in the 19th century, the push factors are where people are forced to leave, is largely associated with the Great Famine of 18, during the what we call the you know, Forgotten Famine or the Little Famine of 1879 to you know, um, 1881. And this just gives you some idea of the pattern in relation to Irish immigration from, the, from 1700 right up to you know, 1960. And you see the numbers associated you know, sort of, uh, with it. But, um, I mentioned there the numbers of Irish leaving. By the end of the 19th century, there were more Irish people but, um, living outside of Ireland. There were more Irish people but, um, living outside of Ireland than there were in Ireland itself. And if I put it in today's context, about 17.5% of Irish born are living outside of Ireland. The next country from the first world that has comparative figures are news of its people living outside of New Zealand. For many in the 19th century, emigration was paid for by funds which the people themselves had are largely through prepaid passage fares, remittances that were sent back by passage fare for people to join um, those who had already left. For many, the immigration was easy, to, you know, easy to, to, to do, but there was a cohort in which they could not pay for their own immigration. They relied on external forces. External External forces like landlords, the poor law unions, you know, uh, philanthropists, you know, um, and the you know, and governments you know, such as the Australian, etc. James Hatchuk is the last of the philanthropists to be involved. Of the philanthropists to be involved in so you're paying the passage fares of people to leave from the west of Ireland. We're talking about, between 1882 and 1884, over 9,500 people actually leaving. As the starting point for Irish immigration, when between 1845 and 1855, as you'll see there, 2.1 million people leave. And this you know, it accelerates then after this, between 1855 and 1911, with 4.5 million that actually you know, um, 4.5 million that actually you know, um, emigrate. But it must be noted that even before the famine, that immigration was on the rise. In the decades you know, the, from 1835 to 1845, the numbers leaving were you know, sort of increasing quite 
the numbers leaving were you know, sort of increasing quite steadily. What the Great Famine did was accelerate the numbers. <clears throat> However, up to 1879, emigration is more regional in its focus. It is largely the very well-off areas that people off areas that people are leaving from. And the numbers actually emigrating from the west of Ireland and the poorer areas of the west of Ireland does not keep pace in the same way as with the rest of the country. Now we do know that the Great Famine is regarded as a major watershed time. The consolidation of holdings which led to a greater emphasis on pastoral farming and a very high level of emigration. But many parts of the country retained what we call a pre-famine structure. So in many ways you're talking about a type of a dual economy. You have the commercial the south, small parts of the west and the north, but a pre-famine uh, economy that is to be found um, you know, along the poor areas. And this can be seen especially in relation to the population. Okay, we know that the population in the country in, know that the population in, the country in general after 18, um, from 1841 onwards is on the decline. Um, going from eight and a quarter million in 1841 to 6.6 .6 million in 1851 and steadily declining. But look at these poor law unions in the west of Ireland, in the west of Ireland, and you actually see the population is increasing at some occasions and decline, you know, to, uh, are just holding steady in you know, the others. Okay, if we look there, Swinford in particular, where the population increases from 51,500 to over 53,000. You know, in Newport at around 16,600. But it doesn't tell us the full story. On account of the fact that there are parts of County Mayo in which, the, you know, at a parish level, in which the population is increasing quite steadily. For example, on Apple Island between 1871 and 1881, for example, on Apple Island between 1871 and 1881, the population increases by 16%. In Bahora, the, uh, the, uh, which is in East Mayo, part of Swinford Port Oil Union, it increases by 9%. The main reason why the population you know, is similar to pre famine, where holdings are very small and remain very small. Here, if we look at the size of holdings, you get some idea. This is from 1881. And we can get some semblance in relation to how, in 1880, the Bessborough Commission, a government-appointed commission, stated that holdings under 15 acres were uneconomical and could not support a family. But if it, these are the areas along the western seaboard and you get some ideas as to where the problems you sort of are. In your, um, Newport, the, um, some, your, sorry, 68% of the farms are under 15 acres, but 40% are under 5 acres. Um, in Balmullet, 72% are, um, are under 15 acres. In Balmullet, 72% are, um, are under 15 acres, and 15% are under 5 acres. So these are, were regarded by a government commission as not being viable and not in a position to support a family. In order to be able to survive, fat had to pursue non-agricultural activities in order to pay their rent. This was through fishing, through seasonal migration, you had, uh, the manufacture of kelp. But the pattern in which how these holdings were you know, the, uh, problematic, this is found in 1880. It is important to realise that farms of 10, 15 or even 20 acres of land according to its quality, are too small to support a family. It matters not whether a man has fixity of tenure or being a peasant uh, proprietor, has no rents to pay. He has some other source of income to live and bring up a family on the small farm under 10 or 15 acres of land which form so, which form so large a proportion of the holdings in the west of Ireland. Now, he is not the only one who is suggesting that farms under 15 acres cannot 
who is suggesting that farms under 15 acres cannot support a family. Here is a landlord who worked with Chuuk on the immigration schemes, who had about 2,000 acres in uh, Mayo and Galway, Rutledge Fair, and in which he said, it is certain that the occupiers of such holdings never could, which he said, it is certain that the occupiers of such holdings never could, nor ever did, live of the produce of the, uh, the lands. And there are examples, small examples, that we get to see how bad the situation. For example, you know, the, on one of the town lands you know, on Ackle Island, there were 250 people trying to exist on 200 of very marginal land. The areas which were really, really important, you know, for the, the, uh, people going, kept them you know, um, able to survive. Seasonal migration. See, and I'll just go on to the next one to give you some idea. Seasonal migration in the 1870s was mainly to be found along the west coast. And the main areas were Mayo, Donegal, Roscommon coast. And the main areas were Mayo, Donegal, Roscommon. Within Mayo, the, the your main areas were your Ackle Island. It contributed about £12,000 a year in the early 1870s to the economy of Ackle Island. About 1,000 migrants left your earning in September, October. Throughout the west of Ireland, the amount of money that contributed is about 250,000, which is quite an enormous amount of money. In areas like Swinford, in the Swinford Port of Union, the, it is, you know, the, the figures of the population were seasonal migrants. But okay, as Cormac O'Brien years ago suggested, you know, the, the figures you know, were down by about, uh, it should be 20% higher. And when you take in the people who are indirectly involved or need seasonal migration, like young people um, under the age of 16 are very old people who remain at home to look after the very young people. You're talking about nearly 90% of the population of Swinford Port Law Union depend, depending directly or indirectly <coughs> on seasonal migration. But seasonal migration has suffered quite bad. But seasonal migration has suffered quite badly towards the end of the 1870s, largely because of the mechanisation of British agriculture. The McCormick Reaper, it could do the work of 100 Irish labourers. As a result of that, there was very little work in 1879. On Ackle, Instead of the 12,000 that had been brought home early in the 1870s, it was now down to about you know, 1,000. In fact, many of the families in Ackham had to borrow in order for their loved ones to be able to, their loved ones to be able to, you know, sort of come back. The decline in the price of kelp, and in areas like, okay, where Brian was talking about this morning, the Irish Keys, the manufacture of kelp was very important. It was estimated that about fifty thousand pounds came into the Western the Western economy as a result of the manufacture of kelp. But again, by the 18, late eighteen seventies, it was under threat, under threat from the industrial potash being produced by uh, large factories in Germany, and also the importation of Guyana from South America agricultural uh, uh, competition. This was where, okay, the Midwest in particular had been opened up by the railways. So as a result, you got the grain and agricultural projects co come into Europe and be sold much cheaper. Shopkeepers no longer giving credit to farmers at the prices in 1876 with the Jay Cook Bank in the United States, which had ripple effects <laughs> in, um, you know, in Europe. But the most important reason for the crisis of 1879 to 81 was the failure of the potato. In Ban In Banmon Port Union, three acres on average of a farm was devoted to tillage, two acres of which went to the growing of potatoes. So this was the main source which people had. And we're talking now about 1879. 
But this was the main source which people had. And we're talking now about 1879, 1880. You have, you have to, um, three months of virtual continuous rain. I was reminded a bit about it you know, there during lunch when we saw that horrendous shower coming down. The, um, but it destroyed the, um, but it destroyed the potato crop. The yield of the potato in 1879 was on par with Black 47, 1.4 tons you know, per, you know, per, you know, per acre. The crisis of 1879 to 1880, the private relief organisations. If we look here in County Mayo, 146,000 were being kept alive by one of these relief organisations, the Mansion House Relief Committee, Duchess of Marlborough Relief Committee, the Land League, New York Herald Relief Committee, are from the Archbishop of Tune. County Mayo, in late 1879, 1880, were only being kept, you know, kept alive handouts you know, they, that were being given to the local relief committees that had been established you know, um, in the West of Ireland. It was at around this time that, that James Hacktook came to Ireland. He was sent by the Society of Friends to report on the extent of the famine and to work with the two main relief organisations, the Mansion House Relief Committee and the Duchess of Marlborough Commission. Duchess of Marlborough Commission. He arrived in February 1880 and over the next 10 weeks visited Donegal and the west of Ireland. Now, Chuck was probably the ideal candidate to send because in 1846 and 1847, he had toured the West of that he had witnessed you know, um, as he went around places like Balmullet, Ackle, Newport, etc. The one thing about Duke, he was not afraid to condemn those who he felt should, be a, you know, should have helped in, the, you know, in helping your sort of people. Should have helped in, the, you know, in helping your sort of people. To the extent Sir Richard O'Donnell, you know, the, um, Sir Richard O'Donnell, you know, the, he you know, criticised because of evictions that had been carried out in you know, Anakil Island. Now, a bit unfair, O'Donnell had leased the land to the Acton Church Mission Society, and they were the ones who had carried out the evictions. But O'Donnell was so incensed, he threatened that if Chuke ever set foot in County Mayo, he would have him shot. One of the interesting things is during his visit to, he goes to Newport House to O'Donnell's granddaughter and has tea with her. And as he says himself in his letters, he said, you know, who would have think I would you know, be here you know, after what I said in 1846-1847? Now, the O'Donnell wasn't the only one he criticised during, uh, during the Great Famine. The other this morning, who had carried out massive evictions, you know, um, just before Christmas of 1847. But what we can see in his writings in Heath Perley you know, um, is his empathy with the Irish. And we can see it here in, when he writes in 1847. I regret that I feel, we can see it here in, when he writes in 1847. I regret that I feel so incomplete to express or des uh, describe the state of total helplessness that those gentle suffering people are reduced to. Tenants of absentee landlords are neglected by those who are living in luxury from the rents collected from the wretched people believe. Forty years later, he was still saying the same thing about the poor. In fact, you know, the, um, sorry. The, uh, uh, he spends his ten weeks going round the West, Donegal and the West of Ireland, but he comes to the conclusion that the conditions of the people is every bit as bad in 1880 as it had been in 1846 and 1847. It had not improved to any great extent. And this led him to look for a solution. And look for a solution. And almost immediately, he leaves in April 18, um, 1882, and he goes immediately to the United States and Canada, in particular to the Midwest and to Ontario and Manitoba. 
speaking to very influential people of the United States, John A. Macdonald, who was the Prime Minister of Canada, and Bishop John Ireland, who was the Bishop of St. Paul in Minnesota, and who was to play a very important role in the emigration schemes. But he comes back, and the, but he comes back, and the, um, he writes an article which is published in the 19th century, in April of 1882, in relation to family immigration. Families and not individuals should be assisted. Now, the reason, reason for this, uh, two, uh, there was two main points to it. Firstly, by sending out families, it meant that a farm would be vacated and the land could be redistributed to adjoining tenants, making their holdings more um, you know, sort of economical. Also, the, by if with emigration, you still had the older people left behind you know, sort of holding on to the farm. At least one fa family me member would have to be able to speak English. Because most of the areas that Chuck went to, there were Gaelic, Irish-speaking areas. He would, there would have to be a situation whereby they, um, somebody would be able to speak English. There had to be a sufficient number of breadwinners in the family. In other words, you could not have a family in which five to six of the members were under ten years in which five to six of the members were under ten years of age, on account of the fact they would not be able to survive according to Chu. And the immigrants should contribute towards their transport. As he went to went along, he mentioned how the poverty is unspeakable, and that misery and suffering are borne out that can never be revealed until some stranger comes poking um, into those out of the way corners. But I think, okay, this statement which he makes to the uh, Parliamentary Commission just showed you know, sort of the empathy he had with the poor of Ireland. He was asked at the time, why are you helping these paupers from the west of Ireland? And he said, I hardly like to use the word paupers, because these people are the rank and file of the poorer classes of the district. Now, in the article comes out in April 1882. The article comes out in April 1882. It resulted in a number of his friends you know, sort of coming together and organising a meeting on the 31st of March 1882 in the London home of the Duke of Bedford, in which established the Duke Committee for the 9,600 pounds was subscribed to help the you know, families move you know, uh, from the west of Ireland to North America. The first place he actually, he actually goes to is Clifton. And the Coral Gardens in Clifton decided that they would provide money you know, towards assisted immigration, £2,000. So uh, Chuk felt he could work with these. But you know, 10 days after he arrived in Clifton, he, he comes to Newport. And he stays in the home of Vissy Stoney in Mulrani. And unpublicized, what it took is actually trying to find out to what extent would your people, uh, would families emigrate if a scheme was put in place? And this is what he said. I think I mentioned in writing that was put in place. And this is what he said. I think I mentioned in writing that on visiting Mulrani near Akla on Monday, and although not expected, I had applications from over 70 families or parts of families in that one small district. Mm -hmm. There had been no publicity about Chuk actually. Mm -hmm. There had been no publicity about Chuk actually coming you know, to you know, Morani or nothing in about his scheme. What he was, you know, what he wanted was he wanted to see the advice of Basin Stone. Now. When he interviewed some of the families, he realised a meeting would happen. Because none of the families could make any contribution towards their travel fare you know, um, out. Another reason why he comes to, uh, you know, um, to Mulrani is that he had heard that the Newport uh, uh, Board of Guardians 
had decided to look for a loan in order to facilitate assisted immigration. However, he found out that the loan was only £100. So you were talking about 20 families or thereabouts that the other could be sent. So um, it wasn't feasible. Now the other problem that he had at the state was the now the other problem that he had at the state was the decision in Clifton to not go ahead with the loan that they were looking for. So all of the the work was put into Clifton in 1882, and it resulted in 1,276 people being assisted. Yeah. I'll come back to this one in a moment. But these are um, the, yeah, sort of the numbers who, uh, from, that leave in 1882. Now, the reason I put it up there is, he arrives in Clifton on the 4th of April. On the 19th of May, six weeks later, people. Think of the organisation. Think the interviews, the selection process. You know, they, and then, organising them, you know, bringing them into Galway, then you're know, from you know, um, arriving in you know, to Quebec or, um, or Boston. And all of that, that done within six weeks. But what it does teach him, what he realises, that immigration cannot be carried out by a private organisation. That really, the government had to come on board. So representations were made. So representations were made to the Glasgow administration. He used his contacts, his friendship, his business acquaintances, etc. And in 1882, the government decided that they were going to push you know, the hundred thousand pounds for assisted immigration, which would include. Now, in addition to um, Clifton, Balmoris, Newport, and Oakdarrard were to be administered as well by the two committees. From now on, the administration of the, uh, of the immigration scheme by Chu of Chu Sydney Buxton. And so he looks after the, you know, the whole thing in Mullet and in Newport. Now, the, um, and these are the boats that they leave, there's 11 of them that leave from Clue Bay. Because, every, because everybody was sorry from Black South Bay. Because everybody was actually sent down to Black South Bay to get the ship there. So people from Inish Beagle, Ackle itself, Yafford, Curran, they were all sent up to Van Muller, and to Van Muller, and then Yafford. <coughs> One of the interesting ones here is the Phoenix. On account of the fact the Lord Lieutenant came down specifically from Dublin to see the operation and came back very, very impressed. Because what had to happen was the ship, out of the fact, as Brian was mentioning earlier, you know, that the waters are quite shallow for very large vessels. So instead, the British Navy had to use you know, sort of some of their smaller boats. You know, one of them was at the Seahawk, which carried the um, the immigrants from you know, the, you know, um, um, the immigrants from you know, the, you know, um, you know, the Black Sod near Ely you know, out to the, you know, the, the large ships. But you see here the destinations that they go to: Boston, Quebec, are the, you know, um, are the main ones. Now, the reason why Quebec are the main ones. Now, the reason why Quebec was the place was on account of the fact that the Canadian government had agreed that they would you know, um, do all in their power to help the immigrants once they arrived in you know, sort of Canada. And the other, the other thing was that Chuk would not let the immigrants go to Boston unless they had friends and relations who were prepared to support them. There's a very funny story that Sidney Buxton tells <coughs> how he's done interviewing the Menachel and you know, the head of the family comes in and he's asked, where do you want to go? I want to go to America. Do you know anybody in America? No. You can't go to America then, but we'll send you to Canada. I don't want to go to Canada, but it's the only place we will send you. 
with no place else. Okay, I go, but it's the only place we will send you, with no place else. Okay, I go, but don't send the wife with me. <laughs> <laughs> so you got some idea of the, 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 the thing that, that are told you know, the, 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 along the way. But the... Sorry. Yeah. Here we have the figures from 1883, where they go from. And if you look, unfortunately, Sydney Buxton combined the numbers from Balmolish and Newport. And you know, they, uh, not differentiating between the two. But nevertheless, you have two and a half thousand that are sent from the numbers that are sent to Canada. Now, the reason why there was a reluctance to go to Canada, there had been no tradition of emigration from you know, sort of the, uh, the west of Ireland to Canada after the famine. People wanted to go to the States. But nevertheless, you know, the 1800 are sent. And you know, they are treated extremely well. 650 of them are taken under the wings of Catholic clergy in Ontario. In Ontario. And they're provided with you know, sort of accommodation, with work, etc. With you know, sort of accommodation, with work, etc. One of the very interesting ones that you know, there, uh, you have two families from Balmullet, but I can't find, you know, for the, you know, find their names, who were sent to Peterborough, Borough, Ontario, who were looked after majestically. And they, you know, uh, they were looked after by descendants of people who had been sent in 1823 and 1825 on an assisted emigration scheme from the North Munster area to this area in you know, Canada. The, we know that from Mayo, the immigrant states, and I'll show some of these states you know, the, um, in a while. The scheme was so successful in 1883 that the government, the, the Chuck Committee, once again looked for money, and £50,000 was made available. Now, the scheme was not as successful in you know, sending out people in 1884, but here we get an idea of where they actually come from. Now, in addition to Balmullet and Newport, the two committee was also now took on responsibility in Swinford. And the ones you know, third, who leave from Clue Bay are actually the immigrants from Swinford. But Clue Bay are actually the immigrants from Swinford. But the, uh, you get some idea, the asterisks, you know, beside them, you know, we don't have the full numbers. Part of the reason why we don't have the full numbers is they took on immigrants as well from Connemara in Galway. Um, Conscious were running out, out of time you know, within um, Canada, the United States. Some of them go, are sent to Australia who have family ties there. But the numbers are not as great as the previous year. They're only half what they have been in 1883, 2,800. But the interesting thing is they are still <coughs> pretty high in Balmolet, Newport, in Balmolet, Newport, and your sort of your um, in your sort of Swinford nearly your sort of six hundred. These are some of the destinations in North America that they go to. The your, uh, the some of the principal ones are Massachusetts. The some of the principal ones are Massachusetts. The, you know, the, uh, there's about 15, 16 places there. Minnesota is another one. Your know, Ohio. You know, and part of the reason, okay, Ohio features so strongly because of the chain migration process that you had. Because of the chain migration process that you had you know, between Akron and Cleveland. Most of the ones who are leaving from Akron want to go to Cleveland. They want to go to friends, relations that have already established themselves there over the previous you know, um, you know, in Connecticut, some of them are sent to mines that, you know, the, um, that have been established where the owners were prepared to take them in. But there are 280 destinations throughout the three-year period that the immigrants are sent to. Now, part of the reason is Chuk did not want large numbers descending on one particular locality which would result in you know, uh, opposition and hostility by only sending one or two people to each you know, uh, parish, each area. 
you know, it restricted the type of opposition there too. Now, what do we know about Fat Summit themselves? Here is one, you know, Dr. A, who was in Belmont, from Belmont originally, and who's in Pittsburgh, or sorry, in Minnesota. This is a good country. There is plenty of work and good wages. I mean to, to let you know that this is a splendid work and good wages. I mean to, to let you know that this is a splendid country for any person to come to. I started to work the following day after me arriving here. Dear friend, I can sit at a table as good as the best man in Balmullet. Thank God I left that miserable place. <laughs> now, <coughs> what is significant in relation to wages, which you know, is used very often to encourage others to leave? But the, the other really interesting here, here is, I can sit at the table as the best man in Balmullet. He would not have been able to sit with landlords, with their agents, etc. But here, agents, etc. But here, he considered his social position <coughs> had improved quite substantially. Quite a number of these letters, and there's about 200 of these letters, you're from these entrants. Um, you know, the, and the vast majority of them are so positive in relation to the new, the new position that they have. However, what I've, you know, sort of what I've found very often in looking in general at emigration is that it's not the first letter or the second letter that tells you the story. It is very often the fifth or the sixth letter. Because the first or the second is from your poverty, etc. But you know, the fifth or sixth letter tells of nostalgia, wanting to be back with their own. Now, in some cases, you know, they, um, the Duke immigrants were with their own. Martin McNamara from Athol went to, do not worry about me. I know more people here than I do at home. You know, so it just showed the sense of how chain migration was so important. One of the major you know, features in relation to the immigration was the money that was sent back in remittances. Duke in 1890 remittances. Duke in 1890 states that about 10,000 was sent back. And, okay, the, the, when you look at 40% of the people who are um, <coughs> from Mayo, you're, we would reckon you'd be talking about between four and 5,000 that were sent back between 1883 and 1890 by the two immigrants. But one of them is very revealing. It's a letter from a Nakal immigrant in Cleveland, in which he says, I do not want you to go to work in England this summer. We can earn as much money here you know, as you will. You know, so here was you know, the you know, uh, where seasonal migration had been so important in bringing in paying for rent. Now you have a situation whereby immigrant remittance was important. I'm conscious I have, of my time. But one of the ways in which we know something about these immigrants, these are the ship manifests. One of the ways in which we know something about these immigrants, these are the ship manifests. And these are just one of them, from Michael Sullivan, you're sort of from the Mullet. And you know, it tells us he was ticketed you know, uh, to Holyoke, Massachusetts, because his wife has three sisters there. Massachusetts, because his wife has three sisters there. And you know, remember the process I said, unless they had friends or relations who would look after them. So here is the Sullivan family going to Holyoke on account of the fact of this connection. Now, uh, I'll leave that out. Okay, why did the scheme come to The decision of the Canadian government to no longer accept Irish immigrants, not the Chuuk immigrants. It was immigrants that were being sent out by the poor law unions at this time as well, who were creating quite a lot of uh, hostility. Opposition of the Catholic clergy and bishops in the West, in particular John McEvely, because and Connemara, on account of the fact they were the ones who you know, um, did a lot of the, the work in recommending who should, families that should be sent. The hostility of Parnell and the Irish Parliamentary Party, who were totally against emigration. The Poor Law Union's refusal to work with the scheme. You know, the Poor Law Union officials, like John King were so instrumental in expediting and, you know, the, the scheme and helping to select individuals. There was a threat by American authorities to repatriate immigrants back, especially in Massachusetts. 
and the good harvests of 1884. Now, the unfortunate thing, and the good harvests of 1884. Now, the unfortunate thing, the harvest was good in 1884. The har in 1885, it was a disaster. And as J.J. Harvey, who worked with you, said, it's a pity that the harvest of 1884 was so good. Otherwise, you have heard that the, uh, much more would have in 18, um, 1884. How important is the scheme? I think the scheme was really important in terms of, first of all, you're giving hope to people who are in per you know, had perennial poverty, you know, destitution, and famines you know, um, in the world. Okay, we do know, because I've been working with quite a number of these descendants over the last while. In fact, um, November, there, you know, at the New Hibernia Review, I have an article in it on you know, how the government <coughs> in Minnesota fared. You know, and it tells the story of Minnesota fared. You know, and it tells the story of you know, the, uh, how they fared in Minnesota. Because Minnesota was one of the up and coming states. Plenty of work, lots of money at the time, and the two immigrants did very, very well. But, you know, they, um, as was, but there was still about £15,000 that remained unspent, and the government refused to allow Chuk to, you know, uh, you know, to spend it. But even back home, it does work out very, very well as well, on account of the fact that most of the farms that were vacated were transferred over to other, uh, to neighbouring tenants. And the more viable and able to support your, um, your family. As I mentioned earlier, okay, the, if you're interested in the Chute story, and because, as I've said, he is one of my great heroes uh, who has been largely forgotten. And I think part of the reason why he has been forgotten is on account of the fact he refused point blank to, to get any publicity for what he was doing. You know, not only was he involved in the immigration scheme, but he saw immigration as just part of the immediate you know, solution that was needed to the problem of overpopulation in was needed to the problem of overpopulation in the West of Ireland. But he wanted its economic development. From 1886, he was working with you know, Arthur Balfour, the chief secretary, in order to um, the, you know, sort of the establishment of a train system in your um, your and mail. He is the person as well. I've seen his papers, the, the papers of you know, the of, uh, which are in the University of Limerick, in which he you know, the driving force behind the establishment of the congested districts board when it was set up in 1890. There is nothing to James Hackchin <coughs> in either mail or Galway. Last August a monument was put up in the Connemara Patch in St. Paul to honour uh, Chuk, but also other individuals like uh, uh, James Nugent, who were involved in bringing people from the West of Ireland to a better life in the Midwest. And I'll leave it there. Yeah. First of all, I'd like to say how great it is to be back in Newport. My very early memories of Newport was my father.